This is Sandy Green, and I'm the organizer for today's webinar uh, titled Considerations for Sexual Assault Programs that Employ or Contract with Mental Health Therapists. The webinar today will be provided by Jennifer Levy Peck, PhD, and licensed psychologist. Uh, welcome, everyone, and I would like to welcome Jennifer into the call at this time. Hello. Welcome to Considerations for Sexual Assault Programs that Employ or Contract with Mental Health Therapists. I'm Jennifer Levy Peck. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and I've also provided management consultation to sexual assault advocacy programs. The learning objectives for this training are stated here. I won't read through them. I'm just going to uh, let you have a moment to look at them, and I'm going to be discussing them in the overview, which is next. Because sexual assault survivors and their families can often benefit from psychotherapy, sexual assault programs may make therapy more accessible by including mental health professionals on staff or as contracted workers. There are a lot of benefits to these arrangements, but there are important managerial considerations as well. The program manager and or the executive director of the agency should be aware that additional policies and procedures may be required to address employed or contracted mental health professionals. This training describes the roles of the people involved, licensure and qualifications for therapists, supervision issues, and mental health record keeping, as well as other administrative concerns. It suggests ways to involve therapists in the sexual assault program while maintaining appropriate boundaries. On the WICSAP website, there's a document called Considerations for Sexual Assault Programs that Employ or Contract with Mental Health Therapists, the same thing as this webinar. I would strongly suggest that you use this document as a reference. It's particularly helpful because it has suggested wording for policies and procedures, and it also contains links to laws and administrative codes, which will be handy for you. I want to make a special note that any policy or procedure that is suggested needs to be looked at in context. Of course, it needs to be in sync with your community, with your agency, and with any other policies and procedures that you already have in place. If you do decide to add any of the suggested policies and procedures, it's important to do a review of any related documents in your agency to make sure everything lines up. For example, if you change a policy or add a new policy, be sure that any related information you provide to clients matches that policy. If you're not terribly familiar with all of the different mental health professions, and those do vary from state to state in what they're called and how the licensure works, WICSAP has a very helpful booklet on their website. It's called What Advocates Need to Know About Therapy. You can see a little thumbnail picture of it here. And the booklet describes the difference, for example, between a psychologist and a psychiatrist, um, how some social workers are therapists and some are not, what the term counselor means, uh, what kinds of therapy are commonly used, and other issues that may be of use to you as you're considering adding a therapist to your staff or contracting with a therapist. So some sexual assault advocacy programs hire mental health professionals as employees, and some have a contractual relationship with one or more therapists. If you do have a therapist on your staff as an employee, or if you're considering hiring a therapist, I believe that it's especially useful to have some specific policies and procedures to address that issue. However, even if you're using a contracted therapist, there are a lot of issues that are still relevant and in common. So this training will be helpful even in that situation. If possible, it's certainly better to hash out these concerns and to develop policies and procedures prior to bringing a therapist on board. That way everyone knows the ground rules before getting started. But of course, it's never too late. If you've got somebody on staff already and you don't have specific policies, you may want to consider developing them at this point. It's always more difficult when you have to create policies in response to a problem rather than having them in place to prevent the problem in the first place. One of the issues that can get very convoluted when you have a therapist on staff is the issue of supervision. There are two types of supervision that you have to consider, clinical supervision and administrative supervision. The clinical supervisor is the person who oversees the therapist's work with clients. The administrative supervisor is the person within the agency to whom the therapist reports. 
So not every therapist has or needs a clinical supervisor. In most cases, the issue of a clinical supervisor will come up when you hire a therapist who's working to complete their postgraduate supervision hours, which are required for licensure. For example, a licensed mental health counselor has to have three years of supervised practice after obtaining a master's degree. So you have somebody who has all of their training and all of their basic credentials for licensure, but they haven't completed the supervised practice. Um, and it's not unusual for sexual assault programs to have some of these people on staff because of budgetary limitations and because there may not be a huge panel of therapists to choose from in your community. So you may wind up with a therapist in training. This actually can be a great thing because you have access to a professional in the early stages of their training and you can help to develop their expertise in the realm of treatment of survivors. It's a, a neat opportunity. But you do have to be very careful if you have a therapist in training that you and the therapist are following the law in terms of clinical supervision. What this means is that if a therapist is not yet fully licensed, they do have to have a clinical supervisor. The clinical supervisor may or may not be an employee of your agency, but they will need to know about the, ther the trainee therapist's clinical work, so appropriate releases and consent forms have to be signed by clients. Even if the therapist you hire is fully licensed, they may not have expertise in sexual abuse and assault work, for example, so they may be working with a consultant to expand the range of practice, another licensed professional who does have that expertise, who's kind of overseeing their sexual abuse and assault cases to help them build that expertise. On your therapy consent forms that clients sign, you should specify the name of the clinical supervisor or the consultant if there is one, and state that these individuals have access to clinical records and information. Of course, clinical supervisors and consultants are bound by professional confidentiality. The clinical supervisor has some legal responsibility for the quality of the trainee therapist's work, as you do as an employer. So one thing you may want to do is to ask your therapist who is an employee to give permission up front for the clinical supervisor to let you know if there's any kind of unprofessional conduct or if the trainee is not meeting professional standards. For example, if a trainee is not keeping up to date with therapy notes and the supervisor has pressed for this but the records are still not caught up, you would want the supervisor to let you know because this is a liability issue for your agency and a quality control issue for your agency. So even though there's confidentiality in the supervisor-supervisee relationship, you would want to ask and to make sure that there's a, a clear agreement that certain things be shared so that you can do your job as the administrative supervisor. Another important thing to note is that if you do have a therapist who's not fully licensed and is under supervision, this has to be clearly indicated across the board. The therapist cannot refer to himself or herself as a fully qualified professional, and clients need to be informed of their status. For example, you can't say you're a psychologist even if you have a PhD in psychology unless you're licensed to practice as a psychologist. You could refer to yourself as a resident in psychology in that situation. All titles and paperwork should be clear about the trainee's status, and the client should be informed who the supervisor is. This could be especially important in rural areas and in small towns because the client might have a personal relationship with the supervisor, in which case another therapist should be used. You don't want to have a client seeing a therapist and find out that the client's clinical supervisor is the, is the client's brother-in-law, for example. That wouldn't be good. So um, if you have a therapist who is an employee of your agency, that person is going to have an administrative supervisor just like any other any other employee of your agency, and this may be you. Um, I've noticed that in some agencies, the lines of authority are not always as clear as they might be when it comes to therapists. But when a therapist is an employee, they're subject to all of the same policies and procedures as other employees. They must have an administrative supervisor who's responsible for performance evaluations and who works with the therapist to set clear goals and expectations for their work. If you're the therapist administrative supervisor, you'll want to educate yourself about what the therapist needs to do in order to be a mental health professional in good standing. Each profession has certain record-keeping requirements and a code of ethics. In addition, the state of Washington requires mental health professionals to keep up with continuing education as a prerequisite for renewing licensure, which has to be done every year. 
so let's assume that you're not a therapist yourself and that you're the administrative supervisor for a therapist who is an employee of the agency. This is a checklist of specific questions that you should be able to answer. You should be able to identify the actual profession of the therapist. For example, is this person a mental health counselor or a marriage and family counselor? Uh, you're going to want to look online and become familiar with the licensing requirements for that particular profession. You want to know if the therapist is fully licensed, or and if not, if they're not fully licensed, you want to know that they have a formal arrangement with a clinical supervisor, as we've talked about above, and that the paperwork from the state is in place to confirm their trainee status. If the therapist is being paid through funding from the Office of Crime Victims Advocacy, or OCVA, either as an employee or as a consultant, OCVA has very specific requirements for therapist qualifications, and you'll want to see that the documentation that there's documentation that ensures that the therapist meets those requirements. Um, you're going to want to know what the continuing education requirements are for that particular profession, and also know that those may change from time to time. For example, uh, fairly recently, the state of Washington determined that mental health professionals need to have a specialized training in suicide prevention, and there's a certain number of hours that may be different from profession to profession. So that's something that they have to keep up with. You should keep all the documentation regarding the therapist's status in the employee's personnel file. You don't want to run into a situation, for example, where a therapist needs 60 hours of continuing education every three years and their license is up for renewal in a month and they're still 40 hours short. You want to make sure that, that you know what's going on and that they're on track to complete their continuing education in a timely manner. So here are some suggested policies and procedures, and please remember what I said earlier. You can't just copy and paste these into your policy manual. You have to customize them to meet the needs of your agency and to fit with your other policies and procedures. Also, legal requirements may change over time, so staying up to date with that is important. But as a very basic measure, it's important to have a policy that says that any staff member providing mental health services must be licensed according to the law or working towards your towards licensure under supervision in compliance with the law. Then you're going to want to consider some of the questions that are on the slide under procedure considerations. For example, who's going to pay for licensing? And this can be pretty expensive. For example, I pay about $300 a year for my licensure as a psychologist. What about continuing education credits? WICSAP usually offers some free or low-cost therapy training during the course of the year, but other types of continuing education can be quite expensive. There's some very affordable online options, but it's important to ensure that they meet the requirements of the state licensing department. So there's very specific guidelines for what meets their requirements and what doesn't. You want to have a clear agreement about who pays for what, and this may be especially important in the case of a part-time employee. The other thing to know is that if the training is a job requirement, which it would be if you're requiring that a therapist maintain their licensure, the agency is going to be responsible for providing time in the therapist's work schedule to attend the training because that's part of their, their job responsibilities. Um, in your policies and procedures, you want, to make it, you want to include some language that makes it clear that if the therapist has any problems or any changes in requirements with regard to licensing, it's their responsibility to tell their administrative supervisor in a timely manner. You don't want to be in a situation, for example, where a therapist has a disciplinary action pending from the state board and you didn't know about it. That wouldn't be good. Um, it's important to keep any licensure paperwork in the personnel file, including an up-to-date professional license, a copy of the professional license, and any paperwork regarding trainee status, if that's applicable. If you have a contracted therapist through OCVA funding, as we mentioned, you want to keep all the documentation that shows that the therapist meets those requirements. Here are some suggestions with regard to supervision policies. These are good policies to have, whether or not the specific therapist you're now working with meet these criteria so you can cover future contingencies. You may want to consider a policy saying that there will be an approved clinical supervisor if that is required and that all paperwork related to clinical supervision will be completed. It's very important to have a written supervision agreement spelling out what's expected of the clinical supervisor and of the supervisee. 
And as I mentioned before, I suggest getting consent from the supervisee so that if there are any professional problems, the clinical supervisor can let you know. So if you have a clinical supervisor who's outside the agency, which is pretty common, um, you want to be sure that they can alert you if there are any things that affect the quality of services that your clients are getting or any liability issues. Um, if you're hiring a, a therapist who's under, under supervision by an outside clinical supervisor, I think it's probably a good idea to have a meeting with the therapist, the clinical supervisor, the administrative supervisor, and if that administrative supervisor is not the program director, maybe the program director too, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page before you get started with having the person, having the therapist work for your agency. Uh, one of the legal requirements for a supervisee is to give the clinical supervisor sufficient information that they can actually be supervised, and it may be a good idea to have this in your supervision policies. And this can also be an issue because the supervisor is going to want to look at clinical records, so you have to be clear about where that can be done. Can, are, are the records allowed to be taken off premises, or is the clinical supervisor going to come into your agency um, to review records? How, how are you going to do this? There may be also be situations where you have a licensed mental health professional on staff, so this is someone who doesn't require clinical supervision, but because of a disciplinary action or because they're extending their scope of practice, they're required to have consultation or oversight by a colleague. If that's so, you should know about it, and there should be a written agreement for that as well. So to get down to the nitty-gritty, it's important to have clear guidelines for both clinical and administrative supervision. If you are the therapist's administrative supervisor, you have to have enough information to know if the therapist is doing a good job because, first of all, you want your clients to have quality services, and second of all, you want to protect your agency from liability. You also have to be transparent with clients if your therapist is under any kind of clinical supervision. So moving on to the issue of mental health records. If you have a therapist on staff or a consultant who works on the premises and maintains mental health records on the premises, you should have separate record keeping policies for mental health records as opposed to advocacy records. Those policies should spell out where the records are to be kept, who has access to the records, and how you're going to keep them safe from unauthorized access and issues such as fire or natural disasters. One thing to keep in mind is that clients have the right to access their own records, and you need policies about how they do that. This means that any records should be written with the client in mind. I think this is good ethical practice in any case, because the therapist shouldn't say anything about a client in writing that they wouldn't want the client to read. There should be transparency with the client, and the client should not be surprised by what is in the mental health record. As an administrator, you're going to need to familiarize yourself with state laws and professional ethical guidelines for mental health records so that you can maintain some sort of quality control. You need to know what is it that's supposed to be in these records in order to meet the ethical guidelines and the state law. As you develop mental health records policies, here are some important things to keep in mind. Mental health records should be kept separate from advocacy records. This means that not only should they, they be kept in a separate locked file cabinet, but only authorized staff should have the key to that cabinet. For example, I, I once went into an agency where there were file cabinets for mental health records and advocacy records in a file room that was kept locked, but the, the two cabinets were kept unlocked during the day, so anybody who had access to the advocacy records also had access to the mental health records. That's not okay. It can't be the same key that's used to access advocacy records, and advocates should not have direct access to mental health files. They need a specific release of information from the client, and that's something that would rarely be needed. Inside these mental health records, you want to be sure that everything is kept in accordance with your own agency policies and procedures, the Washington Administrative Code or WACS, Washington State Law, ethical standards for the therapist's profession, and the best interests of the clients. And there's additional information about what some of those requirements are in the paper that I mentioned, the document that has the same name as this webinar that's on the WICSAP website. I think it's worth looking at that. It's important to have a policy stating that it's the therapist's responsibility to maintain those records in accordance with all of those 
guidelines and laws, and that it's also the therapist's responsibility to let the administrative supervisor know if there are any record-keeping problems. For example, if um, a therapist can't find a record or if there's something missing from the record or if they haven't been able to keep up with their record-keeping for some reason, you ought to know about that. Um, there are also uh, electronic record-keeping software programs that comply with best professional practices, and that's something that you might want to consider, especially if you have several therapists working for your agency. Um, that's a little more specialized, and we don't cover that in great detail, but whether the records are on paper or they're electronic, they have to be kept confidentially. They have to meet all of these requirements that are here, and it's important to know that that's happening. If you happen to have a release of information form in the file for mental health records, it should be specific as to exactly what information will be released and to whom. The release should be time limited to the shortest amount of time necessary to complete the purpose of the release, not just some random amount of time. Most important, a release of information should be based on full informed consent by the client, including the recognition that once information is released, the client loses control over where it may end up. The release of information form should be kept in the file as long as the file is kept by the agency. So these are very similar principles to any kind of advocacy release of information, but you can use the same form, the same type of form, but there should be separate releases for any advocacy information and any mental health information, and they should be kept in the separate files. You don't want to have uh, a release of information from a client that includes both advocacy and mental health information. Another policy that is helpful is what to do with the records if your agency goes out of business or if something happens to the therapist, if the therapist dies or leaves the area or something. This should all be clearly spelled out so that you're not scrambling to figure out what to do if in one of those situations. One of the questions that sexual assault program managers or executive directors may have is whether or not their program is covered by HIPAA. Most of you know that HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and it covers medical confidentiality. You know, when you go to the doctor and they give you all those forms to sign or at the hospital, you've probably signed dozens of these forms. You may or may not have read them because they're in legalese, but um, HIPAA is, is an important uh, law that has come into practice in the last several years, and the answer as to whether your agency is covered is maybe. If you charge or you bill for mental health services, you're covered by HIPAA. If you transmit any electronic information about therapy, even just faxing something, you're covered by HIPAA. There's quite a bit of information online about whether or not a particular agency is considered a covered entity, which is the, the terminology they use. So if you have any questions, I would suggest looking that up. However, even if you don't charge for therapy and you don't ever transmit mental health information electronically and you don't think that you're a covered entity according to HIPAA, I would suggest that you familiarize yourself with HIPAA guidelines. They've pretty much become best practice for confidentiality issues in the medical and mental health field, so it's worth getting to know them. Uh, something that's worthwhile to be aware of is that there's a separate legal status for what are called psychotherapy notes. These are for the therapist's use only unless the client makes a specific request that they be released. What is and is not a psychotherapy note is important, and it's a little bit uh, technical, detailed, so I would suggest that you read the paper that we're, we've been talking about that's related to this training for more information. It will explain that in more detail. The other important thing to know is that therapy records are very different from advocacy records. In the advocacy field, we've worked to make our records as minimal as possible in order to protect clients' privacy. We call it keeping them lean and mean. However, therapy records must contain detailed information, such as diagnoses and treatment plans, in order to conform to professional standards, so they have a lot of very personal information in them. If a therapist does not keep clear and detailed records, they're violating professional ethics. This is where I think it's really important to inform yourself because I have worked with agencies where therapists were under the impression that somehow they should keep minimal therapy records because there were minimal advocacy records and therefore the therapy records were not uh, consistent with what's required by law and what's required by professional standards. So that's, that's a really important point. 
here's another wrinkle because advocacy programs are kind of all hands on deck and most staff members do a little of everything you may have a therapist on staff who's also providing advocacy services most of the time this is in the form of answering the crisis line but a therapist may also be actually providing face-to-face -face advocacy if that's so the therapist should have the advocate core training and they need to be very clear in what role they're functioning which professional hat they're wearing the records for advocacy services and therapy must be kept completely separate, even if it's the same person providing those services. Therapists who provide advocacy services must also have the same annual training that advocates are required to have. Um, and a lot of times they can kind of get a two for one. They can go to a sexual assault therapy training, which would give them the ongoing sexual assault hours but also be relevant for their continuing education hours but here's something that's important to know if a therapist wants to attend a training on sexual assault therapy that's not provided by WICSAP or approved by WICSAP and wants to have it count towards the 12 hours of ongoing annual sexual assault training they need to contact WICSAP well in advance of the training to see if it can be approved there's a form on the WICSAP website under training for submitting these requests but they can't be granted retroactively. So you don't want to have a therapist who's on your staff who goes to this wonderful two-day training on sexual assault therapy and then find out that, that doesn't count for their ongoing sexual assault hours. They need to contact WICSAP in advance and say, you know, here's the information. Does this um, qualify for ongoing sexual assault training hours? You want your agency policies to outline how therapists will provide quality services to your clients. Your policy should clearly state that therapists should make sure their services comply with all the items listed on this slide. And they're the same kinds of things we're talking about when we're talking about record keeping, but this is in terms of what actually happens in the therapy room. You should also identify what a therapist should do if they believe there are conflicting requirements. One other issue under quality services it's not on the slide here but I would like to add is to talk to any therapists who work either as employees of your agencies or as contracted workers about appropriate settings most of the time if they're working with adults the the kind of room that you would have for an advocacy room would work just fine because it's going to be comfortable it's going to be welcoming and it's going to be soundproof which are really the the critical issues there However, in a therapeutic setting, there may be some additional requirements. For example, if someone sees families or couples, they may want to have seating that's separated so people don't have to be seated next to each other, like on a love seat, because that may be too close and they can't look at each other. Um, if you have therapists who work with children, then they may need specific items in the office in order to work with children. So have that conversation and see what you can do. And if that space is shared, let's say a therapist is using it part-time and an advocate is using it part-time, you may have to come up with some creative situations, some creative solutions so that it works well for both people. There's some other administrative concerns that you're gonna to wanna to consider as a manager. An important one is what happens to therapy cases if the therapist leaves the agency or the contract ends and the client is still wanting therapy or needing therapy. What is your agency policy on referrals to outside therapists and does the therapist who's working there know very clearly what that policy is? Um, for, and then even if the, the therapist stays with the agency, there may be situations where it's not appropriate for them to work with a particular client. For example, what if your staff therapist is working with a client and finds out that the client has a very complicated diagnosis and needs to see a specialist, such as dissociative identity disorder. Some, some therapists may not feel comfortable working with someone with that because that can be very tricky management. Um, so you wanna talk through how do you make a referral, who do you make a referral to, what's the agency's policy on referrals, and then what's going to happen, how are we going to handle this as an agency you know, ideally, if somebody's leaving, there's a lead time and you can work with them and they can work with their clients to find the best fit for ongoing therapy. But somebody could have a sudden illness or sudden hospitalization. And as the administrator, you want to be prepared to step in and make sure that the, that the client has seamless therapy if that's needed. You also want to make sure that you've considered liability insurance issues. 
Often therapists will obtain their own professional liability insurance, but that's separate from your agency's insurance. There's nothing wrong with them getting that. In fact, I would, you know, on a personal level, I would recommend that because it protects them, um, but it doesn't protect your agency. So talk with your insurance agent to see if you need to add something to your insurance coverage or get a different type of policy. Because appropriate and timely record keeping is such a critical part of a therapist's job, it should be included as part of the annual performance review. That's really, really important. It's important for continuity of care and it's important for liability issues as well. You may also want to clarify communication boundaries in your agency. For example, if there's a crisis with a therapy client who's also an advocacy client, um, the therapist can't talk about that with the advocate unless there's a release of information. If you have therapists on staff who participate in advocacy case conferences, they need to be careful to maintain confidentiality about anything they've learned in the context of a therapy session. Just so brainstorm with your staff any kind of communication issues. It's also important to make sure that therapists are apprised of all relevant policies and procedures during orientation, including general personnel policies and any other agency policies, along with the policies that are specific to therapists. And this should be documented with a signature in the personnel file. This is sometimes overlooked when the therapist is a part-time employee, but it's important. And if you have a contracted therapist who's working on your premises or if there are any agency policies and procedures that are relevant to them, should go through, they should go through the orientation as well. Some therapists may have a private practice in addition to working for you. You should have clear policies to address this. Accredited community sexual assault programs in Washington State are required to have a policy about private practices on the premises of the agency, whether or not there is a private practice on the premises of the agency. It's a good idea in any case to have that policy. Um, you want to make sure that clients are very clear about whether a therapist who's working on your premises is working for you, for the agency or not, and you want to make sure that there are no financial conflicts of interest or any other kinds of conflicts of interest in that situation. It can be a little bit tricky. If you have a therapist who's working for your agency under contract uh, using OCVA funding, as I mentioned, OCVA gives you very clear qualifications as to who's eligible. Um, and you want to make sure that contracted therapists know what's going on in the agency um, and to have a crystal clear agreement about what to do with client records. So if they're seeing somebody on the premises, can they take records off the premises? Um, what do they do with those records? And uh, what are their safeguards? If they're maintaining records off the premises, you want to know about how they safeguard confidentiality. That's really important. Now we're kind of looking at what to do if you are interested in hiring somebody. If you're hiring a therapist, you're going to want to do your own check on their licensure status. The Washington State Department of Health has this handy-dandy online provider credential search where you can enter a therapist's name and you can see if they have an active license and whether there are any disciplinary actions through the, the state licensing board. And you can also see when their continuing education requirements are due. So even though um, therapists are required to, mental health professionals are required to um, renew their license every year, the continuing education units are due on a certain schedule. For example, for psychologists, it's every three years. And if you look on the website for someone who's a psychologist, you'll see the date by which their continuing education units are due. So here are some questions that I hope will be useful to you if you want to bring a therapist on board. You want to ask, are you licensed, of course, and in what profession? So you want to know specifically, is it a licensed mental health counselor, or is it a marriage and family counselor, is it a licensed clinical social worker? Um, what is the person's license? And if not, are you under supervision, and who is your supervisor? What are your record-keeping practices? So ask the person in an open-ended way. What are your record-keeping practices? How do you keep records? And what you're listening for there is to hear that they're taking into consideration all of the things we've mentioned, the laws and the ethical guidelines, and also what they actually need to provide good therapy. Asking what information do you typically include in your therapy files? 
what are your profession's continuing education requirements and how do you keep up with them? So they should be able to say that off the top of their head. They shouldn't be hemming and hawing about how many hours. Um, they should kind of know where they are with that and have a plan for keeping up with the continuing education because they will lose their license if they don't do that. What are your areas of expertise? And how did you gain that expertise? So you want to ask them. You want to find out what kind of training they've had. Have they shown initiative in seeking out training? Um, do they keep up with journals? Do they go to trainings? Do they do online training? What specific training on sexual abuse and assault issues have you had? You're going to want to ask, what is your theoretical orientation? And don't be intimidated by that question because they should be able to explain that to you in clear layman's language because they should be able to explain that to clients in clear layman's language. How do they approach problems? How, how do they help people with recovery? How do you decide what type of treatment you provide to a particular client or family? And you want to hear that they do look at the research, that they are interested at least in evidence-based practices. They may stray from those because they may not fit a particular client, but they should at least be aware of of that whole concept and be keeping up with the field. You want to know what age groups they work with and which ones they prefer and think about whether that's a good fit for the kind of clients you're going to refer to them as therapists in your agency. For example, if you have a lot of uh, adolescents, teenagers who are referred for therapy by your advocates, you don't want somebody who says they really don't like working with teenagers or they prefer working with little children if you don't have very many little children that you're recommending to therapy. Um, how do you integrate an anti-oppression perspective in your therapeutic work? This is a question they probably haven't been asked in a job interview before, um, but it's so important in our field, and I'm sure you, you talk to advocates about anti-oppression work um, you want to know that even as a therapist, that this person has a commitment to social justice, that they have an understanding of the intersection of oppressions, and that they understand that therapy can't just focus on an individual. It also has to look at that individual in the context of what they have to deal with in their life. And yet there's more. <laughs> um, this is a question that you want to ask, but if they're open to being educated, that's okay too. So what is your understanding of sexual assault advocacy? It's great if you have a therapist who's worked with your agency before and who understands and values the role of the advocate. But if, if they're not too knowledgeable about it, then you're really searching here for openness to learn about it. You want to ask how can therapists and advocates work together and have a sense about whether there's a, a strong feeling of respect for the work that advocates do. Are there any types of cases or populations that you prefer not to work with? You don't want to have a situation where the therapist's preference is not a good fit for your agency. Uh, I think this would be helpful to know, asking them to describe the recovery process from sexual abuse or assault and how they help clients with that process. And again, you can ask them to tell you the way that they would talk to a client about that. And that that's going to give you uh, a sense of their warmth, of their compassion, and their knowledge of the issues and of what happens in the recovery process. What do you know about resources in our community and what would you do if a client needed a resource with which you were not familiar? What you're looking for here is an openness to working with the advocates and making sure that if a client needs resources that they're comfortable uh, either referring them to advocacy services or re-referring them saying, you know, if the person is already working with an advocate, reinforcing that relationship with the advocate. So I think all of these can be extremely helpful as you're considering hiring a therapist. So now you have a therapist under contract or on your staff. How do you ensure that they're going to work well with the rest of your staff and that your agency can get the greatest benefit from their expertise? And how can you contribute to their professional development so they can do the best possible job with survivors? Well, training is always a wonderful way to bring professionals together. Try to find some training topics that would appeal to both therapists and advocates and have them attend together. For example, if there's a training on uh, adolescence and self-harm, you know, both, uh, both advocates and therapists would probably find that interesting. Uh, it might involve sending advocates and the therapist to a WICSEP training or bringing in a trainer. 
You can also have cross-training where the therapist offers information and so do the advocates. It's really important that there's an atmosphere of respect for the professional role of all staff members. Yeah, advocacy is a separate field with a proud tradition that offers something unique to survivors. Many therapists don't really understand the advocacy field, and they may downplay the value of advocacy unless they've seen it in action. Make sure that you don't create a dynamic in your agency where the therapist is the expert and the advocates are not. Advocates have their own very valuable expertise and have a lot to teach therapists who are not as familiar with working with survivors or therapists who don't know much about the advocacy field. Each profession complements the other. Make sure that advocates in your agency know the appropriate way to make a referral for therapy and that therapists know when to introduce or to reinforce advocacy work to their clients. You can also take advantage of therapist relationship with other professionals in the community to build service partnerships that will benefit your clients. So, for example, if you have a, a therapist on staff who has good relationships with the medical professionals in your community, um, that's great, and you can talk about how to help build partnerships for the agency based on some of those relationships. So, in summary, um, I think it's really important to look at the specific policies and procedures that we've suggested and consider which ones might help your agency to ensure quality mental health services. Um, and as we said, it's best to be proactive about those policies and procedures, not to wait until there's a problem. It's really important to have clear supervision practices, roles, and agreements, and to have a clear delineation between clinical supervision and administrative supervision if someone does need clinical supervision. Um, as an agency, you're going to want to make sure that any mental health professionals that you're associated with comply with all the relevant laws and guidelines in the way they provide services and in the way they keep records. And then finally, really thoughtfully considering how you're going to integrate a therapist into your advocacy program and to uh, make that a working relationship that really benefits clients. Thank you very much.